our members. I'm Dr. Anupama Gotimukula. I'm president of AAPI. And uh, thank you so much for joining this evening with us. We have two excellent topics today and uh, excellent speakers. And uh, we are very much excited to provide these kind of educational webinars to our members. Uh, briefly about API. API is the physician's organization. And we are almost 14,000 members in API. But we do represent almost 80,000 physicians all over the country, like all almost 8% of the physicians workforce in this country. So we are there everywhere in the rural areas, academics, research, you name it, you see an Indian name there. Uh, and we have 15, 25,000 um, medical students and residents and fellows. So it's a very strong growing organization, very vibrant. And we have tons of activities throughout the year. So our website is very vibrant now. So our newsletters are especially very busy now, nowadays. So, uh, so I want to welcome uh, Dr. Angela Corsi and uh, would like to hear from you about the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, a rare disorder, neurology disorder. And let me introduce the moderator of the evening, uh, Dr. Bilani Kumar. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, St. John's Medical College, and he did his residency at the University of Minnesota and fellowship at uh, Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. Research fellowships at University of Minnesota and U UCSF, and he's very active in global partnerships. And now he's a chief of uh, anesthesia, pediatric anesthesiology department of, uh, at University of Minnesota. And uh, welcome Dr. Bilani. And I would let you start uh, moderate the session and introduce our speaker. Thank you Anupama for this uh, opportunity. And uh, so far you've been doing a fabulous job as president of API. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Angela Kotsi. Dr. Kotsi is a Director, Global Medical Affairs of Rare Neurology at Pfizer that supports this Duchenne muscular dystrophy. She received her Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and she completed both her residency and fellowships in psychopharmacology at the VA in San Diego at the healthcare system there. That's where our ASA meeting is going to be next oh. week. And uh, Dr. Gotsi spent five years in clinical practice as a psychiatric uh, clinical pharmacy specialist at the VA in San Diego, where she conducted pharmacy-run primary care clinics in psychiatry. And she also taught the pharmacy students uh, from the University of Pacific and the University of Southern California. And since joining pharmaceutical industry for the more than 20 years, Dr. Kotsi has provided medical support in the area of rare neurology, psychiatry, neurology, neuroscience, and women's and men's health. So it's a broad range of things, but I'm glad that you're, you're picking up these rare disorders, which for us in anesthesia, at least are quite challenging and uh, it's, uh, it's good to know that uh, people like you and companies like Pfizer are helping take care of these patients. So today, I am, you're going to be talking on Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So now the, it's up to you to go ahead and deliver your talk. Thank you, Angela. Oh, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, on behalf of Pfizer Rare Neurology and also on behalf of our Pfizer Multicultural Health Equity Collective, I'm, I'm really honored to be with you tonight. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, we were going to have someone driving the slides, but before you go to the next slide, I just want to set the stage just a bit. Um, there are over 7,000 rare diseases worldwide, and 80% of them have uh, a genetic origin. Um, but unfortunately, we only have treatment for about 5% um, of these disorders. As Dr. Balani mentioned, it can be really challenging for clinicians. 
um, you may go your whole career and not even um, treat a, a patient or a young man with Duchenne, but we want to speak with you tonight to raise awareness really from a health equity and uh, disparity perspective so that you are aware in case you do see a young man with Duchenne and really with an effort to decrease that time to diagnosis, to shorten that gap so that they can be referred over and um, be diagnosed and ultimately hopefully receive the treatment that they might need. Um, next slide. So before we get started, we always have our disclaimer slide, and there's a lot of words on the slide, but I'll just say basically that some of the items that I'll be discussing tonight will be forward-looking statements. Um, and so really, um, we, we don't know, you know, because they're, they're at risk. And so really the presentation is only current as of tonight's presentation, because we will have these forward-looking statements in the discussion and things are always subject to change. So, so thank you for your understanding. Next slide. So the agenda for tonight's session, uh, we have a few goals. First, to give an overview of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, of course, and to uh, dive into an overview of gene therapy. I will also specifically focus on the um, Pfizer Clinical Development Program for muscular, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we want you to be able to share your insights. It's gonna be a little bit challenging through the webinar, but uh, next slide. We have developed a few polling questions. Um, and so tonight we're gonna be low tech. And if you uh, feel like just shouting out in the chat function, that would be awesome. But we will try to make it as interactive as possible because I really wanna understand who, where you're coming from, your perspective and some of your thoughts around these questions. Next slide. So the first of our polling questions is around diversity and inclusion. And I'd like for you to think about this. Which of the following aspects of diversity is least achieved in clinical trials, in your opinion? Um, ethnicity or culture uh, or geographic, socioeconomic, or maybe it's something else that we haven't even thought of. And if you could just, um, great, if you could just chime in here on the chat, we've got one uh, for ethnic culture, we've got socioeconomic, there are no right or wrong answers, obviously, it's just your opinion. Ethnicity, thank you. Thank you all for, for participating. Ethnicity, socioeconomic, anybody, are we missing anything that might come to mind that we haven't captured? You can always um, put it in the chat later. Unknown travels, okay, I'm gonna capture some of this. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So when we think about the referral patterns for clinical trials, um, what are some of the contributing factors for referrals to clinical trials? I just came up with a few ideas. Uh, maybe it's patient request. Perhaps it's relationship that you have with the investigator or proximity to the study site because travel may be an issue. Uh, or perhaps it's a presentation that a sponsor might give at a local patient association meeting. Or, or maybe it's something else. Okay, so I'm seeing some chats come in, relationship with the investigator, patient's request, sponsor presentation. Thank you. All of them, all of the above. Okay, uh, next, next question, we'll move on. I realize that, that we've got all types of specialties in the audience tonight, um, but thinking about if you were to discuss gene therapy studies um, with your patients, what are some of the tools that you might need to best facilitate that conversation? Uh, first, would it be plain language resources and handouts, study website, or perhaps um, driving the patient to a patient advocacy website where there may be additional information or something else? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of all of them. Um, Again, if there's anything you think that perhaps as, as sponsors of clinical trials, we might need to think about education to the patient. Fantastic. Okay, next slide. I think that's it.
for the, the polling. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Artish. Um, and so let, let's just spend a few minutes starting with the basics. And we talk about the genetics and the basics of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Actually, it was first described in the 1860s, but dystrophin wasn't discovered as the cause of the disease until 1987. Um, the dystrophin gene is located on the X chromosome, and so boys born to a mother with a mutated gene have a 50% chance of inheriting a Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, um, women, the carriers, um, also um, you know, can be carriers, and they may have some symptoms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Usually, they may have some cardiac issues, cardiomyopathy, um, but overall able to function. Um, so the moms can, you know, obviously are carriers. Now, about two thirds of um, the cases are inherited, but there's about one third that comes from spontaneous mutations. Um, and so that, that's what we're looking at for the genetic basis for Duchenne. Just a little bit of additional information. Um, there's the about one in 5,000 live male births uh, is what we see for the, the prevalence for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it is the most common fatal monogenic disease of childhood. Next slide. The DMD gene mutation is a res results in non-functional dystrophin. And actually the DMD gene is one of the largest human genes uh, in the body. And it's comp comprised of 79 exons and it spans 2.5 million bases. This is gonna be important when we talk about our gene therapy and how we're having to actually package it to get it into, into the patients. Um, the DMD gene encodes for dystrophin protein. And we have a structure of that on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, there are actually over 7,000 different known mutations um, of the dystrophin gene, and most common are deletions or duplications. Um, but what you see is that it leads to a frame shift causing downstream production of a shortened or truncated form that's non-functional. So the dystrophin that's produced is unstable and it's not functional. And on the right-hand side of the slide, what I've tried to do is illustrate an example of what might happen in a patient who has a deletion from exon 48 um, to 50. And so what happens is you can see at the bottom of the slide from 47 to 51, actually it's unable to read through and actually produce the dystrophin protein down at the bottom. You can see it's shortened versus the dystrophin in the middle that has all the key components with the actin binding, the central rod, the cysteine rich portion and the C-terminal end that's important for normal dystrophin what you have when you have one of these um, mutations, uh, deletion, you have a non-functional or shortened dystrophin. Next slide. Dystrophin is important for muscles. I think you all probably know that, but let's just dig a little deeper. Um, actually, dystrophin, you can see it here in the red on the slide, in the bottom right-hand slide. It actually is the part that connects the, the muscle that contracts to the surface of the membrane cell. And so when it contracts, it pulls on the surface of the membrane, and, and the membrane is very fragile. So over time, if the dystrophin isn't there to serve as that tether, that rope, or that shock absorber, what happens is that membrane gets damaged over time time and it actually leads to micro tears in the membrane um, and that can cause influx of calcium and eventually cell death. And I'll show you a slide in a minute and some pictures where you can see with that cell death infiltration of fatty tissue and fibrosis in those in those cells. Next slide. Here we go, here are the pictures. Um, so the pathophysiology of Duchenne. So we'll start with skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle atrophy leads to de decreased strength and loss of mobility in these boys. Um, and you can see uh, you know, down the road in muscles that are required for breathing obviously are affected and that could lead to progressive respiratory failure. Um, on the left hand side of the slide, you see pictures of MRI of thigh muscle and you can see what the normal muscle looks like, whether that be through MRI or staining or immunostaining, um, nice healthy cells. But on the right hand side, you can see pictures in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy boy and you can see the infiltration uh, with the fibrosis and the fatty tissue and, and cell death. 
Now, um, a little bird told me that um, today is the World Heart Day. So we're going to definitely have a big call out to the heart because the heart is a muscle as well. Um, and so Duchenne really is a disease of the entire body. Um, I'm just um, highlighting three areas right now to discuss, but um, the heart and brain are also affected and, and other parts of the body, but specifically on the heart, cardiac muscles um, involvement causes dilated cardiomyopathy and can lead to death. And 30% um, of DMD patients die from cardiac failure. And as I mentioned earlier, the mom, the female carriers um, have cardiac, 20% um, of them have cardiac symptoms as well. The brain is also affected in Duchenne. Lack of dystrophin in the brain causes cognitive and behavioral impairment. And in fact, 33% of DMD patients have mental retardation. Um, language skills are the most effective and um, you can also see cognitive dysfunction. So, you know, everything from ADHD, uh, effect on IQ, learning, language can be affected in Duchenne. Next slide. So this is actually um, a schematic of going through the clinical course of Duchenne. So we'll start at the top and the different stages. We've got the early stage to the middle, ambulatory stage, late or non-ambulatory, and then to end of life. And on the left-hand side of the slide, we, we focus on the different um, body um, organs that are, are, are parts of the body that are affected, as I mentioned, really Duchenne can affect the entire body. We always think about it from the, the muscular perspective. The average age of diagnosis, at least in the U.S., is five years old, but often these symptoms um, show up sooner. And usually when um, the young boys maybe aren't um, progressing as much as their peers, so they have gross motor delays or weakness, some of you in your medical school training probably remember learning about the Gower sign when these boys are actually um, squatting or on the floor and then they use their hands to climb up their legs because of the lack of the strength to, to stand up. So that's a classic uh, for Duchenne diagnostic, the Gower sign. Um, but usually they're diagnosed on average around the age of five. And then as they start to progress in the, what we call the ambulatory or the middle phase, you may see loss of ambulation around 13 years old on average. Um, of course, they have difficulty walking, they're falling more. You may see other organ systems starting to get involved. Um, and then when they get into the wheelchair, usually on average um, in a wheelchair, again, around 13 years old, and you start to see, of course, maybe the need for nighttime ventilation, they'll have more cardiac um, insufficiency, and also swallowing, swallowing can be compromised. And towards the end of life, of course, we're wheelchair bound, they may be uh, on assisted ventilation, high risk of um, aspiration. And on average, um, the age of death is around 28 years old. Now, I will share with you some good news that through the years, and um, because of some of the treatments that are available and really the multidisciplinary approach, whether that be from cardiology, physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy um, have increased the lifespan of these young men. And some of them actually are living into their, their 40s. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, we're going to spend uh, a few minutes on this slide because I feel like it's really of interest um, in, in speaking with the organizers for this event. So I want to make sure that I answer some of your questions. Um, this data was actually pulled from a 2016 global study looking at the prevalence of Duchenne um, and it's estimated worldwide to be five to eight per 100,000 um, men. Now, uh, if you look, or young boys, if you look in the middle of the slide, we actually look at G7, so the U.S., the five uh, EU countries, so UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and then also Japan, uh, we have that data represented. And then at the bottom, lumped together is emerging markets. So that includes Latin America, Asia, as well as Africa, Middle East. Um, and so what we see are that these numbers um, are actually pretty common around, I mean, pretty consistent around the world, where we do have data that's lacking on the epidemiology is actually in the emerging markets, um, just because some of the studies are, are lacking, so more work needs to be done there. And so some of this is modeling data just based on similar uh, countries of similar size. Um, now, 
what I also wanted to share is that in, in recent years, I actually see a change in the incidents that used to be reported at one in 3,500 live births. And now, um, more recently, it's closer to one in 5,000 live births. And uh, the thought for that is actually around reproductive planning um, and medical advances in diagnosing uh, dystrophinopathies and also newborn screenings being implemented. Um, we're gonna hold on this slide for just a few more minutes because what I also wanted to point out is that, um, you know, we're, we're focused on health equity um, with, with many of our disease states and it's just a, a huge priority. And so this is no different for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we do unfortunately see racial and ethnic disparities in the diagnosis um, process for Duchenne. Um, so everything from cultural, social, economic disparities in that diagnosis. And it's probably no surprise to anybody on the line tonight. Um, for example, if you think about um, someone who is coming from a family that might be socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, they may receive care locally, they may not have access to be referred to a uh, regional center of excellence. Um, they also may not have access to the clinical trial. So back to the polling that we, you know, we talked about earlier, it may not be an option for them to travel to be involved um, with the center of excellence care. Or perhaps um, families are working two jobs. And so uh, having a son with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is um, very um, challenging for them. And they don't have time to take off from work to take care of their son and get him to the different appointments. So you can just see those are just some examples um, where the research is really evolving in this area, but clearly we do see racial and ethical and um, ethnic and socioeconomic disparities in the diagnostic process. Um, I also wanted to alert you, to, which you may be familiar with already, the CDC's work around the MD Starnet. And MD Starnet um, actually is the muscular dystrophy uh, surveillance tracking and research network. And that has been around since 2002, and they have over 30 pu uh, publications, MD Starnet. So you may want to look at that after the website, the webinar tonight. But they've done a lot of work and uh, trying to understand the prevalence um, around the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other uh, muscular dystrophies, as well as um, any type of Health, health equity or disparities in the diagnostic process. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So the diagnosis for, for any disorder, right, is a journey. So we can talk about what is the journey from the initial onset of symptoms um, all the way to ultimately the diagnosis and care. And so typically, uh, and this is just in the U.S., um, you know, the patient might, the first um, clinician to see the patient may be a pediatrician, and I'm sure we have some pediatricians on the line tonight. So the family may notice that there's a, a something, a developmental delay, or maybe a school a pre care teacher might notice that there's an issue with, with the boy, and so they'll go into the pediatrician. Um, creatine kinase is testing is emphasized in primary care because it's cost effective, it's available, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity. Um, so it's, it's elevated in boys with Duchenne. Um, now, as you all know, um, CK can be elevated for other reasons as well. So that's why it's good to, to get these young men uh, referred and have them um, actually evaluated by perhaps a general neurologist or a neuromuscular specialist. Um, I, I want to also point out that while the age of, di of diagnosis in the U.S. is around five years old, um, there is that gap between onset of symptoms and diagnosis, even in the U.S., but you can imagine around the world even larger gaps. Um, and I was able to actually pull some data, and I just um, wanted to share this with you. This was a study that was done back in 2014, and they looked at th that gap in age of onset of symptoms and age of diagnosis. For example, the time, the gap in the U.S. Uh, was, and this is in, um, in months, uh, was about um, two and a half years, okay? So, um, so about um, 28, 28 months or so on average in the U.S. When you go to Brazil, it's 54 months. When you go to India, it's 58 months. China, 56 months. 
um, and in Malaysia, 41 uh, months. So, um, you know, depending on where you are in the world, this is just one study that pulled data from certain areas, but there is a gap between initial onset of symptoms and that time to diagnosis. So anything that we can do, and hopefully through webinars like this, uh, and around the world to educate clinicians um, to be aware of the signs and symptoms and the red flags of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and then um, CK testing and then, and then hopefully refer the patients over um, to the appropriate clinicians um, to manage their care. Next slide. So we're gonna shift gears here for a few minutes. I would like to catch you up to speed in case you're not aware um, of some of the treatment options that are available today. And as I mentioned earlier, things are changing and that's for the better. Um, so up until 1990, there were no pharmacological treatments available and the boys lost ambulation usually around 12 years old and death occurred by around 20 years old. The good news is, is that with the use of steroids that began in around mid 1990s, that's now the standard of care. And here in the States, we have prednisone. Um, in the EU, they have deflazacort, which is not available here in the States. But if you'll focus over on the right-hand side of the slide at the top, you can actually see, the, this actually looks at a graph by age on the x-axis and on the, the y-axis, the percent of ability to walk independently. And it's actually divided out by steroid naive in the white bar or clear bar. In the black bar, it's current steroids. And in the gray bar, it's any past use of steroids. And what you can see, uh, it, the gentlemen that are actually have received steroids or currently on steroids, uh, the greater percentage ability to walk independently. Um, and again, steroids are, are the standard of care uh, for these young men. The other thing that has helped with that increasing that lifespan is aggressive ventilatory support. Um, and so through working with respiratory therapists, um, lung volume recruitment, cough assist, um, and intermittent uh, ventilation and, and um, assistance has actually helped patients to live into their 40s with ventilation. Next slide. Um, so this, I, I forgot to say, I'll just go ahead and mention it. Um, steroids are fantastic, but I think all of you know that there are some limitations, obviously with steroids. Um, of course, every medication has side effects, but some of the things we think about with steroids being, you know, weight gain, behavioral changes, um, bone mineral density issues. So again, um, just wanted to point out some of the downsides to steroids. Now looking at some of the other approved agents um, in the uh, EU, um, they have available translorna or adalorin, and the mechanism of action for that agent is actually it substitutes a random amino acid for a stop codon so you can actually um, produce the full length protein. Um, this agent is not available in the U.S. It was actually um, re rejected by the FDA back in 2017, um, so not an option here. They are still trying to get it approved, um, but not, not available today. The Exxon skippers may be something that you are familiar with, and the first one being approved here in the States in 2016, and that was Exondus 51. And that's actually for patients who have a mutation, they're amenable to Exxon 51 skipping. And the way these Exxon skippers work is it has the antisense oleonucleotide and it tricks the splicing machinery to cut out more exons so you're able to maintain that reading frame. Um, so what you end up with is a shorter protein that has both ends are intact. So kind of similar to what we might see in a Becker um, muscular dystrophy patient versus a Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient. Um, now these exon skippers usually are given uh, intravenously once a week um, and they're not they, they don't work for all um, young men because it's only for those young men who have a mutation specific to that exon 51 skipping in this case and that's only about 13 percent of Duchenne uh, patients. Next slide. In the same theme, we have two other exon skippers, 
uh, beyond is 53. And as you might imagine, similar mechanism of action, but um, just for the patients amenable to skipping exon 53, that was approved in 2019 here in the US. And also Viltepso, which is um, another exon skipper for exon 53 approved in 2020 of August, and one more that is actually not on the slide that was just approved earlier this year here in the U.S. is Amandus 45, similar mechanism of action, but for patients amenable to exon skipping um, 45. But again, in summary, um, these drugs are usually given, you know, IV once a week, and, um, and that's for the lifetime of these young men. And also, um, they uh, don't cover all the boys because it only depends on the, the mutation in those young men. Next slide. I'm going to grab a sip of water, excuse me. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I know you can't read the words on the slide, um, and I always hate it when people say that, but I, I did it for a snapshot just to show you the robust development program that's out there. I actually took this screenshot from a very reputable patient advocacy group, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, or PPMD, and they have a very nice site where they break down different agents in development, uh, whether it be dystrophin restoration or drugs to decrease fibrosis or in, uh, decrease the loss of muscle mass or increase cellular energy or preventing ca uh, cardiomyopathy or regulation of calcium. This is just a snapshot of agents that were targeting dystrophin restoration. And you can see across the, the slide, whether they're in preclinical all the way to patients here in the US. Um, and so really a very robust development plan, everything from exon skippers um, all the way to gene therapies as well. Next slide. And speaking of gene therapy, um, so I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about the different genetic medicine approaches. Now at Pfizer, um, the one that we are focused on is in vivo recombinant AAV based gene therapy. And that's on the left-hand side of the slide, but let me just go through all of them, um, just a level set. So gene transfer uh, can be accomplished through in vivo or ex vivo. Now in vivo, we're using that recombinant um, adeno-associated virus capsid to deliver the gene into the cell nucleus. It can also be accomplished through ex vivo, where the patient cells are removed and transduced with the desired gene and then reinfused. So um, both of them, the attempt is to repair or replace a dysfunctional gene. In the middle of the slide is gene editing, and that is another approach that's being studied. And that could be examples of CRISPR or zinc finger, but um, precise change of the patient's DNA using site-specific or targeted nucleases. And that's to permanently remove or modify or add a gene. And then on the right-hand side is gene um, regulation, where actually they are changing the expression of the gene by targeting the RNA, um, and that can modify gene expression. Next slide. So specifically, when we look at gene therapy, and again, you know what we're, we're doing at Pfizer and what I'm sharing with you tonight, I wanted to walk you through how this works. Um, there's a copy of a working gene that is identified and packaged in a carrier or a vector. And the vector is given through an IV in the arm, um, and it travels to the organ in the body of interest. And the organ cells can use the DNA code in the gene to make that missing protein that causes um, the disease. And so that's illustrated here at the bottom of the slide with these simple cartoons. Next slide. Now getting a little bit more technical, we're gonna spend a few minutes on this slide. Um, so we have our um, construct, which is a mini dystrophin gene therapy. And it has a new generic name that is a mouthful, but I'm going to do my best to pronounce it. It's Fortidistrogene Movaparvavec. Um, often I'll just say Fortidistrogene for short, but that's the generic name. And this slide, let me just walk you through it slowly. But um, as I'd mentioned earlier, we're using the adeno-associated um, virus uh, or vector. And that, that viral vector shell holds the DNA that we want to deliver to the cell. Now, we've specifically chosen the serotype 9 or AAV9 because it actually is very efficient in targeting skeletal as well as cardiac transduction. 
So within that vector, that capsid, um, we actually place our mini dystrophin. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the dystrophin gene is the largest gene in the human body. And so it's too big to fit into the AAV9. Um, and sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Oh yeah, we'll take the questions at the end. Thank you so much. Um, and so it's too big. So actually what we, our scientists have done is actually created a mini dystrophin. Um, and so the approach is to take out the middle of the gene to allow the two functional ends to still be intact so that our dystrophin can still act as that spring or that shock absorber. It's just shorter, but hopefully, you know, it can still function even though it's shorter. And our mini dystrophin is actually modeled um, quite closely, look in the middle of the slide, to a Becker muscular dystrophy patient uh, gene sequence. It was taken from a family with Becker's, which is a more, a milder phenotype uh, muscular dystrophy. And the family had a very mild case and they were actually walking through their uh, mid fifties. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, um, we've, we've modeled our construct after the Becker muscular dystrophy. And the other thing that we have done is added a specific promoter at the beginning. So you'll see at the top of the slide, the muscle specific enhancer and promoter that actually targets um, skeletal as well as cardiac muscle. So that's the construct. Let's go over to the next slide at this point. Thank you. Um, so just a few minutes on our overall development program. We actually have four studies that are either planned or ongoing uh, with our Forta Dystrogene. Um, two on the left are ongoing, and I have actually listed the uh, national clinical trial number from clinicaltrials.gov here on the slide. So if you'd like to read more about these studies, the inclusion, exclusion criteria, uh, where they're located in more details, you can find that on clinicaltrials.gov. But the first one is our phase 1B study, which actually um, is being conducted in ambulatory young men ages 4 to 13. And then more recently, we've expanded that study to include some non-ambulatory boys. We also have an ongoing phase 3 trial for the ambulatory population, uh, kids ages um, 4 up until their 8th birthday. And again, this is ambulatory. Um, and this is actually um, hasn't started here in the States yet, but it is available in other countries around the world. And then we are planning down the road to have two additional studies so that we can really get from the early symptomatic through the, the later stage or non-ambulatory boys. So the first is the phase two, looking at that early symptomatic in the two to four-year-olds, and then a phase three uh, with no age restriction on the non-ambulatory young men. Next slide. Okay, let's see, how are we doing on time? I just wanna make sure to do a quick time check. Oh, we're doing great. Okay, so um, I just wanna mention again that large phase three global trial, um, the Cifrio trial, which is in our uh, ambulatory young men, uh, was actually started this past December um, of 2020. First patient was dosed in Spain, December 29th, 2020. And as of right now, we have 25 sites around the world in 10 countries, and we are continuing to expand. Again, it's not started yet here in the U.S., but um, many areas around the world that, that this study is um, ongoing. So in summary, what I just want to recap that we've actually um, spent some time going over, you know, what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy? What is gene therapy? And then specifically talking about Pfizer and what we're doing with our gene therapy, uh, mini dystrophin construct and our trials. And I hope that I've also shared with you uh, what we're trying to focus on, and that is really raising awareness of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and doing seminars such as these so that we can shorten that gap, that time to diagnosis, whether that be here in the U.S. or around the world. Uh, and really all that is done in the spirit of ultimately having health equity um, around our Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, disease state for these young boys. Um, next slide. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your time this evening. Uh, I see a lot coming in on the chat. So perhaps at this time, we're, I think we're right on schedule. I'll open it up for um, 
the chat and the Q&A. So let, let me just, let's see, Dr. Balani, would you like for me just to start reading through? Let's see. Okay. Has Pfizer, okay, this is some great, thank y'all for being so engaged. Has Pfizer explored telehealth and telemedicine support to families who cannot access centers of excellent, excellence? That is an absolutely fantastic idea. Thank you so much for whoever put that in. Um, I, I can't say specifically, I, I, we are looking into it. I will give you an example. Uh, in our clinical trials, um, that is something, obviously, a lot of us have had to pivot, right? But that's something that we have um, been able to flex in the clinical trials so that some of the studies could be ongoing. So telehealth visits and evaluations. And I do um, feel sure that our commercial development team uh, is also looking at how we can ramp up telehealth so that these young men can, can have access. And I, and I also know that patient advocacy groups, um, such as MDA, PPMD, and others are also exploring these avenues. So thank you so much for mentioning telehealth and telemedicine. Um, yes, somebody had a question? Uh, Dr. Bilani, you have any questions about? Uh, unmute, uh, Vijaya, can you unmute Dr. Bilani? So oh, we stuck on mute. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Can you unmute, Vijaya? Oh, good. So now I just got to... Go. Uh, He's back. Okay. <laughs> He's there. <Yay. laughs> that, was a, that was a great uh, talk, uh, especially on a topic that's not uh, very common for most people. So I learned a lot from this. And uh, as you know, in anesthesiology, one of the reasons, one of the drugs called succinylcholine, it, had a, it, it developed a black box warning and this was because of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And uh, there was a patient who got succinylcholine and got uh, developed cardiac arrest because of significant hyperkalemia. And then that patient was resuscitated, transported to a hospital where they could put that patient on ECMO. And then they found out that the patient had, had Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The patient did go on to survive and then the FDA was alerted and uh, we, uh, the black box warning came about and, uh, and they said anybody less than nine years of age uh, should not be getting succinylcholine. And, and the reason they picked nine years is because there could be a delay in the diagnosis of Duchenne's even up to the age of nine. Is that correct, Angela? Yes, and, and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I when, when did all that happen? When about what time it's frame? Been at least it's been at least uh, 15, 20 years. That's what I thought. Okay, because I was thinking when I was in clinical practice, I remember that. Um, and and thank you so much for for sharing that um, that story. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. So you think about up to nine years old. Um, I think we're I think we're better now. You know, at least at least here in the states, you know, to diagnose sooner. But but because of the disparity disparity issues, it may be older. Yeah. Is this newborn testing screening test is that done routinely or only when you suspect that there might be somebody having this problem? Okay, so that's that's an interesting question. So the newborn screening it's available. Um, and the answer is no, it is not done routinely, not yet. And so there are some ongoing pilots around the world. There actually is one in New York state, as well as in Germany and I believe Wales, and there may be others um, looking at pilots. And so I think we may see some developments with this um, in the future, but right now it's not on the uh, routine screening panel, uh, the RUSP um, yet even though the technology is there. And my understanding from reading on this and the reason for that is, I think there has to, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of costs behind it, right, in doing that. And, and I think from a um, uh, public health perspective, when there is some treatment that actually um, they feel will actually make a, a huge difference, that's sort of the criteria where the um, authorities look at adding that to the routine screening. So right now, I'm not aware that it's routine um, newborn screening anywhere in the world. Okay. And but, if somebody wanted to get the screening, does the test have to be done anywhere specifically or it can be done in most laboratories? You know, I, I believe it can be done 
um, most anywhere. I'm not aware it has to be, be done anywhere specific. Okay. Yeah, are, there any, are there any patient advocacy groups for Duchenne's like we have for the MPS Society, things like that? Is there one for Duchenne's? There, there are many, many, many. Um, I'm just going to focus on the one here, the ones I know of here in the U.S. And there are some, you know, many around the world. They have sister, sister advocacy organizations around the world. So there is um, MDA or Muscular Dystrophy Association is a fantastic resource. You've heard me also mention PPMD, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, fantastic resource. Um, there's also one called Cure Duchenne. Um, and there, there are many more, but those are the three big ones that I know that I work closely with and some of the, the work that we're doing from an educational perspective. Outside of the States, um, we also work with um, groups such as TREAT and MD, um, Parent Project Apps in Italy. They're, they're just many, many, almost every country. Um, and our medical affairs colleagues are working with the patient advocacy groups in almost every country around the world, which is fantastic. Good. So the other thing you mentioned was the, the incidence and it's worldwide, it's the same throughout the different countries. So it shouldn't be any different even in India, correct? Correct, that is my understanding. The data to date does yeah. not show any differences in, in countries around the world. Now, now the differences may be that time to diagnose is right, so, but I yeah, it, it, it seems to occur all around the world, no different. So we have a, India has an extremely large population. So the number of patients that have this disease obviously must be quite large as compared to some other countries which are with less of a population. Yeah, that, that, yeah that, that would be, I don't, I don't have the data, but yes, I'm following you, absolutely. Okay. Now, genetically, it looks like it's a disease of males are there any females that have Duchenne's that you know of? I know they can be carriers, like you said, but can they actually be symptomatic and, and become sick like the boys do? Very, very rare. Okay. Uh, it can happen. And it's actually less than one in a million cases. Um, so again, very rare. And um, it, it has to do with um, the skewed X inactivation. And um, again, one in a million chance. With the, for the girls to have it. Can, can they have any mild symptoms, the carriers, the moms? Yes, absolutely. So um, muscle weakness. Um, I know a lot of these moms are in registries. Uh, they're being followed um, routinely from a you know, cardiology perspective because of the risk of the cardiomyopathy. Um, so I know that there's a whole network, you know, an effort to get the moms into registries and follow them and more studies to come with the moms as well. That's very interesting. So should they be genetically tested? And before they, would you give them any advice about, about raising a family? Well, okay. So I, no, I would not. However, however, <laughs> there are definitely um, wonderful geneticists out there. And that's where MDA, PPMD, you know, a lot of this is free. And so they have fantastic genetic counselors that will meet with these families and, and, and walk them through it and, and every step of the way. Um, because, but yes, you know, to understand, you know, what, what are your chances? And, you know, once a boy is diagnosed with Duchenne, then they can look back and see, you know, aunts and, and family members to see, um, see the genetics there in the family. There's one question there that you may have seen the efficacy of NIV PAP therapy, uh, when and how early? I don't know the answer to that one. Do, does anybody, do you know? No, I don't so know. How, how early you start this gene therapy as soon as it is diagnosed or you have to have symptoms or see the progress or what if a patient in, in the late teens comes and uh, you know, can they go for this gene? Okay, therapy? okay, got it. Um, so we don't know the answer. Um, that's why we're studying it right now. So. Um, you know, we, we think, you know, the, the thought, if you just walk through the science, you would think that, that that's why we're studying down in the two-year-olds. Can we start it earlier? Because what we haven't touched on tonight, but you're probably scratching your head thinking, uh, I've already had this question, um, is it's a one and done right now. 
And the reason it's a one-time therapy and right now no redosing is because of the risk of um, they develop the, the neutralizing antibodies, right? And so then you could not redose. And so it is, this is a huge question of when is the right time um, to, to treat these boys with gene therapy. Right. Um, so we're studying, you know, down in, in the future, the two year olds, but right now looking at the ambulatory, you know, four to eight year olds, and then the non ambulatory, the older boys. So um, time will tell when is the right time, but it's definitely um, something that we've heard from families, from patient advocacy groups, from um, regulatory authorities is, you know, this is something that we need to figure out because of that one and done. Awesome. When, when I saw that uh, gene therapy, uh, when you give it through the IV route, uh, there is a blood-brain barrier, and about a third of these patients can have brain involvement, like you said. So does this, end, does this gene get across the blood-brain barrier, or does it just prevent, just prevent the distal phenomenon like in the rest of the body? What happens to the brain? Okay. Okay. So my understanding um, is that it, it can cross the blood brain barrier. Um, now we are not specifically studying that right now in our pivotal trials, our outcome measures. Uh, we don't have anything right now um, from a primary outcome measure on cognition. We're looking obviously at um, muscle function, right? So things such as um, uh, a six minute walk test or, um, you know, other, the North Star ambulatory, these are standard assessments in the Duchenne world. So we are not looking at any cognitive outcomes, but perhaps something to study in the future. Absolutely. And does it prevent cardiomyopathy also, the gene treatment? Okay, so because you're you're thinking because we talked about the heart's important, right? Um, so that's something that we are exploring as secondary endpoints in some of our trials and exploratory endpoints. So we we don't know. I mean, theoretically, um, perhaps that's that's why we're studying it. Okay. Well, there are some of these rare diseases like Gaucher's, for instance, mm -hmm. where we are actually injecting the gene directly into the brain because the, the, the vector doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's why I asked, because there are patients who are getting gene therapy and, and it uh, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So they're injecting the gene, not only peripherally, but also directly into the brain. Wow, okay. Yeah, so it takes a special effort, takes a special team to do that. And uh, that has been successfully reported recently. Uh, for San Filippo syndrome, for instance, and for Gaucher's disease. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm also looking, someone says, is there a genetic link between Parkinson's and Duchenne? Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, no, nope, not that I'm aware of. Uh, someone says, what are the right answers to the survey question? Oh, it, it, there are, it, it's your opinion. That's what I said. We want to hear from you. We want your insight. So thank you for, for your engagement. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's Go good. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't see any more. Our newer drugs have shown a mortality difference. Um, no, not yet, not yet. So that's still to be determined. Um, the steroids, that's all. Yeah. The steroids. Exactly. Um, so I hope that, you know, thank you all so much for, for spending the evening with me and allowing me to, to um, learn from you all and to share in this um, really, really important conversation. Um, and I think we want to keep Thanks. it going. Um, I've already learned about some, some leads and um, some of your, your work that you're doing in India. So perhaps we can touch base afterwards so I can learn more. Um, but, but I just really appreciate all of your engagement tonight and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank, you. Thank yeah. you. That was a very, very good. Uh, well, outstanding uh, presentation and good, yeah. to, good to meet you. Oh, nice to meet all Excellent. of you. Thank you so uh, much. I, I really paid 100% attention to this talk oh, okay. um, because I just did one case last week and, uh, you know, that's the one well, I... Uh, I'm sure I have, must have done around eight to 10 uh, in my anesthesia career of these cases who come for anesthesia. 
and we we strictly avoid uh, succinyl choline and we strictly avoid the anesthesia gases no sevo fluorine or anything like so we have to prepare the anesthesia machine not to have any small percentage of any of the gases which can trigger this uh, um, high calcium release and they go into cardiac arrest right away so it's a very very dreadful disease and unfortunate disease in the trans in families when there are more boys like the one i did recently had two siblings who have the disease unfortunately um, so I feel very pity for them and uh, thank you so much for this uh, excellent um, you know gene therapy is something very promising now for most of these rare diseases I think it's a good to know about it and uh, maybe we can help our patients you know refer any of our patients, you know, you know, this is a good, good one, actually. And uh, you can, you can stay and listen to our next speaker as well. Uh, excellent speaker program.